Hello everyone and welcome to Edisurge Clinics where we discuss some key topics related to common medical and surgical practice. Today's topic is post-operative pancreatic fistula. There is a lot of literature on pancreatic fistula and what we have done here is we have summarized the key points that are necessary when you encounter the situation in post-operative period and we described the various management and mitigation strategies that have worked in the literature across last 15 to 20 years. So in this talk, we are going to see the basic definition and grades of pancreatic fistula. We are going to see the risk factors that are most commonly seen to affect clinical outcomes and utilized in various risk models. We are looking at the management of pancreatic fistula in brief and then we are going to look at the mitigating strategies. So if we just want to enumerate the complications of pancreatic surgery, we know that pancreatic surgery is complex and the incidence of complications can be in the range of 3 to 5 percent. Out of this, pancreatic fistula or pancreatic anastomotic failure rates are close to 20% to pancreatic occlusion failure rates of up to 30 to 40% in history and in recent studies it's somewhere between 10 to 20%. Post pancreatectomy hemorrhage is seen in 1 to 8% of cases and most of these cases will also have a pancreatic fistula. Delayed gastric emptying is one of the most common complications of pancreatic head surgeries and is seen in 20 to 50 percent of patients. Other complications include biliary fistula and upcoming area of interest is post pancreatectomy acute pancreatitis which has now been described as an entity by the international study group on pancreatic surgery and there can be intra-abdominal collection. Now, when we go to pancreatic duct disruptions, which encompass all the pancreatic fistulas, the types can be internal fistula or external fistula. External fistula can be a side fistula or an end fistula. That is the complete duct is transected, which is known as duct disconnection syndrome. In internal fistula, if it is anterior, it can lead to pancreatic ascites. If it is posterior, it can go across the diaphragm and lead to pleural effusion. And if it is contained in an area, it can result in formation of pseudocyst. So this classification gives you all the different types of manifestations that pancreatic fistula can present with. Now going to external pancreatic fistulas, these can be due to Postoperative pancreatic fistula, which most commonly results from pancreatic surgery and splenectomy. There can be post intervention pancreatic fistula, as seen after pancreatic necrosis management, or there can be traumatic pancreatic fistula. Now, for the rest of this talk, we are going to focus only on postoperative pancreatic fistula and we are going to look at its risk factors, management strategies, and mitigation strategies. So the first definition of postoperative pancreatic fistula came in 2005 and this was revised in 2016. The amylase should be more than three times the upper limit of the normal serum amylase value. And if this is the only manifestation up to three weeks from the date of surgery, and this is an important change in the 2016 definition, that if there is no clinically relevant change, and the drainage is there up to three weeks from surgery, then it is just a biochemical leak. So this part is very important that if the drainage goes beyond three weeks or if there is a clinical relevant change in the management of pancreatic fistula, only then is it known as a grade B pancreatic fistula. Now the management strategies that are included in grade B pancreatic fistula simply are all the strategies other than reoperation and organ failure. So previously we had around 10 points that we, we were required to see in order to grade into grade A, B and C. It was seen that grade A was essentially of no clinical value. So this grade A has been combined with just an elevated drain amylase into biochemical leak. 
if there is a clinically relevant change within three weeks or if the drain is required more than three weeks, then it is a grade B fistula. Percutaneous and endoscopic drainage, angiographic procedures and infection without organ failure are all grade B pancreatic fistula. Only cases with organ failure or which result in an unfortunate death of the patient or which need a reoperation are included in grade C pancreatic fistula. Now, Strasberg in 2007 gave this concept of pancreatic anastomotic failure versus pancreatic occlusion failure. And this is basically based on the difference in the surgery. So, pancreatic head resection is followed by an anastomosis and the failure of this anastomosis can result in a leak of fistula or a hemorrhage. And this is a pancreatic anastomotic failure. Versus surgeries with distal pancreatectomy where the steps taken to occlude the duct fail and result in an occlusion failure. So now going into the risk factors for formation of pancreatic fistula, basically there are modifiable and non-modifiable risk factors. Going to patient factors, age more than 70, long-standing jaundice that is more than 3 weeks, impaired creatinine clearance and malnutrition are patient factors which are risk factors for pancreatic fistula. Among comorbidity, coronary artery disease increases the risk fourfold. Obesity leads to increased risk. Diabetes is protective because most patients with diabetes will have a fibrotic pancreas and this prevents anastomotic leaks as we will see. When we go into etiology as risk factors for pancreatic fistula, neuroendocrine neoplasm per se when we operate patients for any ends, the rate of pancreatic fistula is high. In comparison to when we operate for chronic pancreatitis or adenocarcinoma, the risk of pancreatic fistula is less. Based on type of surgery, the central pancreatectomy has the highest rates because there are two curtains and the fistula rates are as high as 60%. Whereas in all other surgeries, the rates are lower than central pancreatectomy in decreasing order of uh, pancreatic fistula rates after central pancreatectomy is enucleation and distal pancreatectomy and the rate is lowest in a Whipple procedure. procedure. Now, when we see risk models, there are some key risk factors that are considered in all these risk models. There are around 10 to 15 risk models and it is humanly not possible to remember all of them. But what we need to remember is the three to four key factors that lead to pancreatic fistula in almost all these models. We see the data based on risk models and we see the management strategies based on these risk factors. So as the number of present risk factors increase, the chance of having a fistula increases. And that is why the risk models were developed to see how much fold increase is there in the pancreatic fistula when more than one risk factors are present. So some of the key factors that are relevant to pancreatic fistula risk include a low volume center that is performing less than 25 cases in a year and a relatively inexperienced surgical team. Combine this to a soft pancreatic parenchyma and a small duct which is defined as less than 3 mm this is a recipe for disaster and this is where blood loss is estimated to be more than one liter. What these factors will result is in, in water said area at the neck of the pancreas due to blood loss and increased uh, intraoperative fluid and blood transfusion. There will be edema in the anastomosis and there can be ischemia in the area if the dissection is not done in the right plane or if the pancreatic transaction is done in the watershed area. When you combine these three, four factors, that is soft parenchyma, small duct, blood loss more than one liter, and a low volume, low center, and an inexperienced surgical team, this provides the ripest field for biochemical leaks or pancreatic fistula. So now we see the latest ISGPS classification and even in this classification the key points that are discussed are soft pancreatic parenchyma and small duct that is duct less than 3 mm. If we see various risk models just to highlight the fact that the points that are important are soft parenchyma, 
small duct, blood loss and surgeon inexperience. There is a risk model that is present on pre-operative risk score as well as intra-operative risk score. And if you see the points, they are gland texture that is soft pancreatic parenchyma, the pancreatic duct diameter and the blood loss. So if we see the soft pancreatic parenchyma causes a five-fold rise in incidence, pathology leads to three-fold rise in incidence, Pancreatic duct diameter less than 3 mm leads to threefold rise in incidence and a blood loss more than 1000 ml leads to sixfold rise in incidence. So various risk models but essentially identical risk factors that have been studied. So now based on these factors, unfortunately if a patient has a pancreatic fistula, the most important thing is to identify it early in the post-operative period. And clinically, the most important point is deviation in the normal clinical course. If a patient is recovering and is apparently normal in the initial post-operative phase and then starts feeling unwell, this is one of the most important signs where you should start checking the drains. Unexpected upper abdominal discomfort, fever, increasing tachycardia or other complications like hemorrhage, biliary fistula should all raise a suspicion of a pancreatic fistula. Checking the drain, a persistently high drain output, altered drain color and quality and high amylase content of a drain compared to the laboratory normal serum value should also raise the clinical suspicion of a fistula. Looking at some of the common drain colors, this is an essentially normal looking drain output. Mildly worrisome drain output in the second image and definitely a pancreatic fistula with probable intra-abdominal infection in the third image. So you should be watchful of these drain colors and this very clearly gives you an indication of whether a patient has a pancreatic fistula. Now, this fourth image that has come up is not only a pancreatic fistula. If it is a pancreatic fistula, it is also accompanied by what is known as a chyle leak. So, character of drain is very important when we take rounds in these patients. Postoperative day 3 is very well established in managing these patients. We routinely send drain amylase and serum amylase on postoperative day 3. This is the latest article published in 2023 where they have studied the relevance of neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio and they have given a cutoff value of less than 8.5. That is when the neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio is less than 8.5. It has a high predictive value that the patient does not have a pancreatic fistula. The study needs validation in larger data sets. Coming to management, a conservative approach is successful in over 90% of patients and what is required is nasogastric suction if the patient has associated delayed gastric emptying. Enteral nutrition is the most favored form of nutrition and we can use a nasojejunal tube or a feeding jejunostomy if it was already created. Appropriate antibiotic coverage when signs of infection are present. If the abdomen has not really settled only, then we should consider total parenteral nutrition. Otherwise, enteral nutrition should be the nutrition mode of choice. Abdominal drains and main wound need to be checked routinely. And these patients should also be monitored very closely and may need an intensive care unit setting. Lung infection needs to be prevented in these patients as in all abdominal complications. Effectiveness of octreotide in aiding the closure of fistula has not provided encouraging results in studies, but we do use octreotide to reduce the volume of the drains in cases where the drain output is very high. In addition to conservative management, the other options include endoscopy if intraluminal source is suspected for bleeding or it may need an angiographic embolization if there is a bleeding or a resurgery for bleeding. Other things that may be required is CT guided drainage of collections if there are new collections or repositioning of drains. And the last option is resurgery where you may need lavage feeding jejunostomy and repositioning of drains. The last option that is used in managing is completion pancreatectomy which has very high 
chances of adverse outcomes and so he is not favored routinely coming to attempted mitigation strategies like i said octreotide has now been recommended in high risk pancreas that is the pancreas with the risk factors that are present as we discussed previously the routine use is not advocated operating loops and magnification is definitely helpful and is recommended a lot of debate has happened between pancreatico jejunostomy versus pancreatico gastrostomy as well as different techniques of pj and pg however there is overall no major difference in the fistula rates the aim or the key to reduce fistula is not selecting one of these techniques but standardizing the technique that you use in your surgery and as has already been said experience matters when these surgeries are to be performed stented anastomosis again depends on personal preference of the surgeon as there is no significant difference in leak rates when we talk of distal pancreatectomy there is no difference when various stump closure techniques are used total pancreatectomy is a new kid on the block where they advocate total pancreatectomy for high risk pancreas what is a high risk pancreas the tetris trial is aiming to define this procedure and the eligibility criteria whenever the patient has mpd less than 3 mm or soft pancreas that is the major criteria bleeding stump or friable stump during surgery posterior or eccentric duct deep pancreas and invisible duct or ongoing acute pancreatitis are minor criteria the results of this trial are not expected before 2024 25 but it is important to remember that total pancreatectomy is being considered in cases with high risk pancreas as an option to a high risk anastomosis thank you